now I'm recording what I'm saying and doing, so you can go back and refer to this later online if you want, and now you've at least got a blank slide that you can write some points about. So what's the definition of homologous chromosomes? Something for you to work together in your groups to define, perhaps. Are there homologous chromosomes in this picture? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where? Okay, so let's talk about the, that's the easiest one to pick out, the X chromosome down here in the bottom. That's two homologs. Those are homologs. That means it's two different copies of the same chromosome, two Xs, or two chromosome 1s or two chromosome 2s. Each of our cells, we're diploid, we have two copies of every chromosome. So when I say two copies of every chromosome, which I've said a lot in the past few days, what, I'm, what I could say instead is homologous chromosomes, which means that one of them came from your dad, so chromosome 1 inherited paternally, and chromosome 1 inherited maternally. Simple. Now things get kind of weird. How many copies, how many molecules, just a second, how many, let me ask first and let people think and then I'll take your question. How many molecules of DNA, if I circled here in blue, so think about that. And bless you. And yes. Uh, is that supposed to be on the January 30th slide? Or is that like so I just added that on the fly. Okay. So it, you'll see a blank slide without this figure. I'm hoping everybody will at least be taking written notes, either on paper or on the tablet, where, the blank, where this blank slide is. But yeah, you won't have this in the PDF file. Now it only exists in the movie that I post to YouTube after class. How many copies of, or how many molecules of DNA have I circled in blue? How many double helices are in there? Okay, this is a, this is going to be a good discussion to have. So why are some people saying four? Four is the right answer. And then everybody says, oh, shit, I thought I understood <laughs> genetics. <laughs> so let me add a different picture. Or if it's not X-shaped like this, when you see an object, it's two double helices. So there's two circled in red. They're just right next to each other. You can't actually visibly distinguish the two double helices. And we'll talk about this, because this, really, this is a really important point that is always unclear, but I want to make sure is as clear as possible. So that was a human karyogram. Let's look at gorillas, just for fun. OK. Homologs, homologous chromosomes, circled in blue. There's gorilla chromosome 1. Two homologs. Chromosome one that that gorilla inherited from its dad and one from its mom. So how many molecules of DNA or how many double helices are circled there? Four. You can see them. Right? If we blew that up, if I made an ideogram, that object on the left that's Two, that looks like a really elongated X is two double helices that touch at the centromere. Right, so there's a centromere right there. That drawing is meant to represent that thing. Right, it's two double helices. It's an X-shaped kind of thing. So that's four molecules of DNA. Four double helices. And there I'm circling another two double helices. So 
anytime you see something that looks like we think that's a chromosome, two double helices. So these have an obvious centromere? Right. So that picture we were just looking at, you just can't see where the centromeres are. Right. right. Yes. So all chromosomes have centromeres, it's just that early in the cell cycle, you can't tell where they are by looking at the chromosome. It's later at this stage you can. Please. Um, this is Bless for an insular organism. For a tetrapod organism, then we would have like the four copies in each one. Right. So if this was a tetraploid organism, it would have how many homologs? Four homologs. Four, it would oh, have. I mean, for yeah, it would, I don't know. <laughs> there would be four homologous chromosomes. You'd see something like that yeah. in a karyogram. So at metaphase. Tetraploid, how many double helices is that? Eight. Eight D helices. Yep. Do scientists actually have like the cardiogram for a tetraploid? Yes. Yeah. So you could Google it or do a web search for it. Um, tetraploid organism, then find out the name of a tetraploid organism, then search for organism name karyogram. See what pops up. On my guess is salmon. We talked about salmon briefly, but salmon tend to be polyploid. They have multiple copies of the chromosome. Okay. A couple other points to briefly reinforce. So somebody brought up centromeres. How many different names do we have for centromere positions on chromosomes? How many was that? I heard four. Who said that? I'm going to make you tell me all four. No, I'm just kidding. So we name chromosomes based on the location of the centromere along from top to bottom. Okay. What's chromosome 12? Where would you say that its centromere is located? If you just described it to me verbally. It's in the center. It's about halfway from top to bottom. So that's called a something centric chromosome. Meta for middle. So that's a metacentric chromosome. Anytime the chromosome is divided about in half, the position of the centromere is right in the middle, it's a metacentric chromosome. Let's see. What about chromosome 7? It's hard to tell. In fact, I don't even know if I really believe that those are homologous <laughs> chromosomes. Do you? One of the ways we know which chromosomes are homologous visually is the length of the chromosome and its position of its centromere. So do those two look like they have the same length and centricity? Position of the centromere, length, the same or not? This is highly debatable. There is no right answer. But this is the sort of question I might ask you on an exam to help test your understanding of how we do chromosome nomenclature. Pick chromosome 7 and tell me, do you think that those are homologous chromosomes or not? If not, why? Go ahead. Um, if those, so if this is due to cell division, could it have been during replication too if one had a duplication of a gene zone that elongated but it's still meant to be with chromosome 7? Fair enough. So let's say, for example, which chromosome 7, let's say just arbitrarily that the one on the left is paternal and the one on the right is maternal. What could happen to the paternal copy to make it look different from the maternal copy? Which one's longer, P or M? P. OK. M is what sort of centricity? It looks pretty metacentric. Centromere is right about in the middle. What about the P? The paternal chromosome, that is. 
This is what we call sub-meta. It's slightly off-center. Sub-meta-centric. That's a B. So if you wanted to, and hey, this is going to sound familiar. If you wanted to explain how those two chromosomes are different, what could have happened? Could there have been insertion was the question. So my question to you then is, how would a duplicate or a duplication of DNA, how would a duplication explain this? Where would it have to happen? Where would DNA content have to be duplicated to make these two homologs, if they really are homologs, look different? Okay, so what if there's some extra DNA here that's a duplication of something else that was on the, that arm of the, P chrom the paternal chromosome? So you copy and paste DNA right next to itself, makes that arm of the chromosome a little bit longer, which also makes the chromosome then look like it's no longer in the middle of the chromosome. Alternatively, you could imagine that maybe this, the, maybe the P version is the original version. What if there was a deletion of that material from dad's copy of the, relative to dad's copy? Maybe mom has a deletion of part of this chromosome, and she passed that on to this individual, their offspring. And so maybe, how would we know that these are still both chromosome sevens then? They look different. <laughs> ah, so we'd need to know something about the genes. So it might be, for example, that the short arms all contain exactly the same genes. I'm not going to make up gene names. We'll just call them genes A, B, C, and D. So if we knew that genes A, B, C, and D were both on the short arms of those chromosomes, and we knew that genes F and G were still down here on the bottoms of the chromosomes, that would be enough information for us to decide, yes, those are homologous chromosomes. They're the same chromosomes because they have the same genes on them, it's just that they look different in size because there's also been some, a deletion or an insertion. When you have a submetacentric chromosome, the chromosome arms aren't the same length. This is the last nomenclature-ish thing. We have specific terms for the short and the long arms. What are they? P and Q. Mind your P's and Q's. What is the P arm? Let's talk about chromosome 8 then. Which one's the P arm? P is the short arm. Q is the long arm. And how do you remember this? Supposedly, P stands for petite, small. And... I've heard that that may not actually be true, that that's just a mnemonic somebody made up to remember, but whatever, now you've got it too. What I heard after that was that Q stand, stood for the word Q or long line, like you're queuing up to watch a movie, standing in the line to get tickets or something like that. Regardless, P, short arm, Q, long arm, they only exist for submetacentric chromosomes where the centromere is slightly off center. Obviously, there's no longer and shorter arm if it's metacentric, by definition. And then we have two other types of chromosomes, acrocentrics and telocentrics. So acrocentrics may be chromosome 18, for example, where there's just a tiny little nub of short arm, barely some DNA you can see above the centromere and acrocentric. Telocentrics basically have no short arm at all. It's telomere in order down the chromosome. Telomere, centromere, coding DNA, that is the stuff, the genes that makes up the DNA and then or makes up the chromosome and then another telomere. So when the telomere and the centromere are right next to each other, those are telocentric. Yeah. Um, as far as radiograms go, homology structures are not always like paired. So they should they are. Well, let me ask you to clarify a bit. You mean 
One way I could interpret that question is, is this the way chromosomes look when you look at a nucleus? Is that what you're asking? They're homologous chromosomes. We've paired chromosomes that have the same DNA content that we inherited from our dads and our moms. But there are some times when you look at an individual's chromosomes, be it a plant, animal, whatever, and they don't quite look exactly the same. What's an example of that? I try to come up with one here where you imagine that one parent has a deletion of part of their chromosome and another one doesn't. So when you have their kid, obviously the chromosomes aren't quite going to look the same, even though they're both copies of chromosome 7. What are other situations where you have chromosomes that don't match when you look at an individual's chromosome? Yeah, the X and the Y chromosome. Presumably, I've got a Y chromosome I got from my dad, and that's why I'm male, I think and an X chromosome that I got from my mom, they definitely don't look the same. They don't even have the same genes, but they're considered homologs because they're the 23rd pair. What was acrocentric? Acrocentric is when you can see just a tiny little bit of DNA. There's, it, you would consider it to be a short arm, but it's barely visible. In practice, for this class, I will not ask you to distinguish acrocentrics and submetacentrics because that's very qualitative. How small does the short arm have to be before you call it an acrocentric chromosome? I don't mind. Or I, don't, I don't care at this point. So metacentric, centromeres in the middle. Telocentric, the centromeres at the very end. Anything in between you can call acrocentric or submetacentric. I don't mind. And there isn't a really good example of a telocentric pair on here, so I'm going to draw one. Here's an ideogram of a telocentric, what it would look like. Right. No short arm at all. So it looks like a V, or an upside down V. And again, each of those lines actually representing a double helix. Now let's get on to this rearrangements exercise. I want to make sure that I've got some time to give you a little bit of feedback on that. So I chose a few at random from your submissions. Thank you for those of you that did submit these. I chose a few of them to talk about in class. And a few of you wrote and said, how exactly do you want me to represent the sorts of inversions, deletions, and so forth? And I said, be creative. So I didn't have a predefined notion of what your submissions of these exercises were going to look like. So here's one. So what's the goal here? If we take chromosome, so imagine that discussion we just had about one homolog, the other homolog, they look different. The centromeres are in different places. Maybe they're slightly different lengths. That's basically what we're talking about here. We have two related chromosomes. They both contain some of the same genes. Here I've numbered the genes. So what do you know for sure has to happen? What was the most obvious thing to happen between species A and species B, or homolog A and homolog B? It gets shorter. So we have to somehow get rid of what genes? We have to get rid of gene 2, gene 4, and gene 5. Because over here, when we get to the end, we just need 1, 3, <laughs> Six, seven, eight, and yeah, I nine. <laughs> okay. So that was what happened in this submission to the first step, deletion. What are these red squiggly lines? Those red, right? I'm colorblind. Red squiggly lines represent on the first chromosome. Okay, this is chromosome breaking. Right? If you're going to delete something, if you're going to delete, this is critical. If you're going to delete gene two. 
there has to be a break between one and two and a break of the chromosome between two and three for that little chunk of DNA to float out and float away. So a deletion requires two chromosome breaks. Were all of those necessary? Right, so what's the simplest? This is the critical part. I know I said it was critical before, but now this is really critical, if you can trust me. Both the genes four and five get deleted. So which one's more likely to happen? That, that there are two chromosome breaks that I'm gonna number in black here. But there's two chromosome breaks, one and two, and gene four, gene four gets deleted. And then there's a third break here, and gene five gets deleted. So that's three breaks to delete two genes. Or is it more likely that we have break A here on the left side and break B on the right side and genes four and five go away all at the same time? Which one's more likely? A and B, a and B together. Right? It requires two chromosome breaking events to do that instead of three different double-stranded DNA breaks on the version on the right side. So this is simply the concept of Occam's razor. The simplest explanation is usually the correct one, otherwise known in genetics and other disciplines as the concept of parsimony the simplest explanation, or the explanation requiring the fewest number of changes is most likely to be correct. So we know from empirical observation that DNA breaks fairly regularly, the double helix, but not super regularly. So if you require multiple lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of break events to explain some transition from left to right, it's not as likely as one that requires fewer steps. And that's why I use that word in this assignment, steps. How many steps does it take to go from left to right, and can you do this in the fewest number of steps? What I really meant by a step is how many times do you have to break a chromosome? Because the more breaks you have, the less likely it is to have actually happened that way. That's why we're looking for the fewest number of steps or breaks. I understood from the directions that any time you do make a deletion or you, know, you make a break, everything that follows goes with it. So I just kind of rearranged it so that two, four, or five are on the bottom. Let's see. Yeah, so you could, there are some clever things that you could do. And another thing that I'd like you to maybe play with, if you still have a copy of the original PDF file, is to go back to what you submitted. And you said, I think this is the right answer. Try doing exactly the same steps that you use, but do them in a different order. So if you had step one, two, three, and four from left to right, Try doing one, four, three, and two. See if it still happens, see if, see if it still works exactly the same way. That is, is the order in which you wrote from left to right, this deletes and then that inverts and then that inverts, is that order important or could you do it in any order? I'd like to know what you think about that. The simplest way to think about that is, does the deletion have to happen first as it's drawn up here, or could it happen, could those deletions happen in the last step? So let's take a very simple example. I'm just gonna make up, oh, let's see, except I need to have something that's missing. Okay, there. On the fly. So what are some ways we can get from left to right? So we, need to, we know we need to delete C, so I'll do one version in red. So we get rid of C, then we have what order? A, B, D. Now what do I have to do? Hmm? Oh, I want D still there. 
So what do I want to invert? We've got ABD, and we need to go to DAB. So I'm going to break that and suggest that there's an inversion there. That gets me to something that's bad. But am I done or am I not done? Uh, who thinks I need to do something else? OK, what do I need to do? Yeah, I just need to flip it. Except we're talking about a molecule of DNA. So everybody get up and stand on your heads. Right? It doesn't matter whether or not Rotating an entire molecule of DNA is just like that molecule of DNA is floating around in your nucleus. It can turn upside down. That's fine. So these two molecules, BAD and DAB, are equivalent. Right? It doesn't matter which order you write them in. It's the same molecule. It's just rotated. Not, no inversions, no chromosome breaks necessary right, to flip that whole molecule. That's not a step. So that's two steps. Now, how can I do this without doing the deletion first? Inverting. So I could invert A and B. That gets me to B, A, C, D. Then what? Then delete C. Then I can delete C, and I get the same answer. So the order of steps wasn't important. Very good. All right, I'm hearing a lot of chair squeaking. So here's what we're going to do. If you have other questions about this, bring them next time or come to office hours right now. I'd be happy to discuss. I'll take your question before we're done. And I want to pull up the slide of what you should do for next class. Okay. So there is a video. Sir, what would you like to do? Um, one more question. Oh, so we've got one minute left. Yes. Is the translocation just as likely, or is it? Okay. So critical, one last final thing, 15 seconds. Translocations and inversions are not the same thing. So a translocation is a part of a chromosome moving from one homologue to another, like chromosome 1 to chromosome 2. So we'll talk about more of that at the start of the next class to try to clarify that. Yes, that would be, that would be that's something we haven't talked about yet. So I'll see you next class, and check this out. There you go.